the thing that shocked me after the writing of Stealing Fire a couple of years ago, which was all about peak states and how there's this kind of revolution of harnessing them, accessing them for greater insight, information, you know, healing and collaboration. So far, so good. But in the couple of years since the book has come out, I've been shocked by seeing how many communities harnessing those things are just putting it straight in the ditch and buggering it up in all the ways uh, that have happened in the past with seemingly no awareness of the list of known issues and the, the disasters of the past. So talking of the list of known issues, you've put together an ethical cult checklist yeah. um, off the back of this, off the back of what you've been saying. Yeah, well, what I realized was, I, you know, basically this began, uh, you know, 20 years ago for me in graduate school, where I just was fascinated with um, millenarian and utopian communities and movements through the centuries. So 17th, 18th, 19th century, the Oneidans in New York, and then all the way to the 50s and 60s and the kind of booming of the boomer counterculture. Uh, because as a Gen Xer, right, growing up in the aftermath of the Reagan-Thatcher years, right, it was a wasteland for progressive transformational consciousness, culture, you name it, right? Very different landscape than now. And the only reference points we had uh, were to go back to the beats in the late 50s, the counterculture of the 60s and say, okay, this was the last place, you know, this, this thread was before it went underground. So I felt a little bit, it was a little bit like our generation was almost like, you know, Zeppelin and the Beatles and, you know, and, and Pink Floyd and those guys with the British rock invasion, where they went and you know, studied assiduously Robert Johnson and Mississippi Delta Blues and Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf and Chicago Blues, and they, kind of, they, they fetishized it, where American pop culture had kind of moved on and forgotten it all. And then the Brits were like, that's just, that is gold. You know, let's really go back and look at it and bring it back to life and reinterpret it. So we kind of had to, because it was just such a, such a bleak landscape uh, for our generation. My sense is, is what's happening with the millennial generation is that, you know, and some of this is, uh, you know, some of this is just classic family dynamics kind of stuff. But, you know, there's nothing more boring uh, or more, you know, worthy of contempt than what your parents did when they were your age. And so my sense is, is that the offspring, you know, not the boomers, but the echo boomers the millennials, right, are a, law, a massive and rising generation, um, all sorts of cultural influences, but they are remarkably um, unaware of the lessons learned of the hippie generation and the counterculture. And so my sense was is that, you know, again, going back to the, the dynamics uh, talked about in Stealing Fire, which was ecstasis, like peak experiences, they tend to go hand in glove with catharsis, deep healing and breakthroughs. And the moment you have that dialectic, you know, stand up on the mountaintop, weep and be broken open, pick yourself back up again. Well, we don't do this in isolation, right? So we end up in communitas, right? Well, that's the social part. So it's the three-legged stool, ecstasis, catharsis, communitas. And whether that communitas becomes pre-rational cult, right? Or post-rational emergent coherence is entirely up to us. And the bit that has been shocking me, beyond the weaponization and the troll stuff online, there's actual, the, the actual communities of practice in the world right now that are repeating chapter and verse the uh, most spectacular errors <laughs> of the 60s and 70s. And so, you know, if we pan back and just set the stage for a sec before jumping into the checklist, um, the idea that peak experiences and healing create tightly cohered, tightly bonded gatherings of people is sort of table stakes. That's been since Neolithic era, you know, with drumming, chanting, gathering around the fire, singing our songs, grieving our dead, you know, mating and mating and, and praying, you know, the whole bit, right? I mean, as long as we've been human, we have done these things together. Um, and so it's not necessarily a bad thing. And if you really, you know, like, you know, etymologically, if you take the description of the word cult, cultus, it comes from Latin, and it just means to worship. So we've been doing that forever. And you know, you know, scholars of religion look at mystery cults, right, back in the ages for the last thousands of years, and there's the cult of Eleusis in ancient Greece. There's the cult of Kali in India. There was the cult of Christ, you know, before Emperor Constantine had his come to Jesus moment and made it a state-sanctioned religion. So a, a traditional cult, 
right, which was just a way, a, a community of practice gathered around peak experience and healing together, right, is absolutely, completely pro-social, positive, part of the anthropological record and a thing we do. And the, the directive there was you subjugated yourself, right, you, you, you dropped your separate identity to join with the lineage. There were those who have come before you for centuries, thousands of years, for time immemorial in many cases, right? Um, you sub subjugate to that lineage. In the 60s, right, we got culty cults. We got those folks that said, subjugate yourself to me. I'm a Ronin. I am, I am a samurai without a temple. I am a self-appointed God-man or God-woman. This is where we get Charles Manson. This is where we get Jim Jones. This is even where we get Adi Da, who is more challenging and problematic because he actually did also light people up. I think Manson, it's fair to say, was just a fucking psychopath, right? But Adi Da was a bent realizer, you know, and those are problems. Osho too, you know, those are more sort of crazy wisdom magi um, with issues where the other two were just whack nuts. But nonetheless, right, that's the general neck of the woods. And that's kind of, that's the trigger when we think of the word cult. So in some respects, we want to reclaim the term. And the next question is, what do we do now, right? Because, you know, we can't go back to ancient traditional stuff. Those, those lineages are all broken and we wouldn't submit to that level of compliance. The culty cults speak for themselves and clearly don't want to repeat those experiments. But what is the realm for ethical cults? What is the realm for a place where you no longer subjugate the self at all? In fact, you actually valorize and support individual sovereignty, but at the same time, create space for collective coherence. And that arguably is our project these days. Right? How do we harness ecstasis you know, and healthy catharsis for vibrant, right, self-authoring, right, collectively cohered communitas? And so to the point about, you know, and that's nice, and that seems interesting, and let's go do that, right? But um, to my point about, you know, Churchill had that great quote, uh, he who knows only his own generation remains forever a child. And I think we've got some decidedly childish efforts going on right now as people grab onto the lightning rods of peak experiences. And, you know, you can take the Burning Man community, the transformational community, the psychedelic renaissance and the ayahuasca scene, and you, you name it, people playing with matches, right? And I always think of um, a little bit like that, that Disney film Fantasia, that classic, right? Where Mickey is the sorcerer's apprentice, right? And the magician, the actual mage, the one who knows magic leaves. And Mickey's like, well, fucking hey, that looks good. I'm going to put on that pointy hat with the stars on it. I'm going to grab the wand and I'm going to use magic to do all the dirty work I don't feel like doing. And then obviously hell to pay, right? Faustian bargain 101, you know, just, just with, with the Disney Mickey ears attached. And so I think we're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing a lot of false light. We're seeing a lot of people taking the claim uh, that they're not actually ready for or conditioned for. And that in conjunction with not knowing the prior generations is creating a resurgence of bucket number two, culty cultic tendencies. So you know, now, yeah, we can for sure um, articulate perhaps a checklist for folks because the idea is, is any communities of practice we're diving into, and I think you've got a list of some that you've been tracking and paying attention to, um, we are at risk of giving away our sovereignty in service of the power and the potency of some of these experiences. And as we give up our sovereignty, we often lose our discernment, our just common sense and judgment, and we can end up in places, you know, that are not safe, not positive, uh, wildly problematic, and can take years to recover from, if at all. So hopefully this is just a little bit, um, if we're taking a stand, right, for individual sovereignty, um, part of that is cognitive literacy. I actually understand what's going on, on on route to cognitive liberty. Therefore, no one can can claim space between my ears without my consent. And so hopefully this checklist is just a little bit of an inoculation that you know folks can use. And the idea here is like, hey, um, we can't mandate any of this shit, right? I mean, particularly the nature of peak experiences are that they are fundamentally antinomian, right? They do not subject to hierarchical tops-down control. And that is both their greatest promise and the greatest challenge, 
because the greatest promise is, hey, this is how we subvert the dominant paradigm. Yay. The other, but, but the narcissistic reactionary one is, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> right? And so how do we strike that balance? So my sense is, is that ideally we would have a code of conduct for ethical culture. Right? And it's obviously opt-in and elective, but so is the UN. Right? And it could be that idea of saying, hey, um, if you want to follow these best practices, and this, this is just a rough first draft, I mean, who knows, we can come up with a thousand others and they will iterate over time. But let's just use this as a test case and say, hey, um, like the UN, you can opt not to be in the UN. You can be North Korea or Iran. If you want to be in the UN, you agree to free and fair elections. You agree to open markets. You agree to civil liberties and the protection of humanitarian rights, the Geneva Convention, et cetera. And in exchange, you get access to all of our data, all of our research, the IMF and the World Bank, right? the League of Nations notion. You get, you get access to all the network effects of being in good standing. You know, and another option would be sort of, you know, Standard & Poor's or Moody's ratings for companies. You can do whatever the hell you want as a CEO, as, as uh, WeWork has just been exploring. Um, but you will run the risk of having your bond rating downgraded from AAA to junk. And it's not that junk means you don't get to play. You still have a right to exist. But it just means that only the foolhardy or the incredibly savvy slash cynical investor will opt to play. So there is a signal in the marketplace, and in this case, the marketplace of ideas, the marketplace of culture, that lets other folks know approximately what they're getting into. Right? So that said, some of the options, I mean, this was just, and this was just 20 years of you know, research academically, seeing the patterns and seeing the premises, and then also noticing what gave me the willies, basically, um, and trying, you know, watching certain communities. And, and they break down into three things, which is, you know, here's the culty cult checklist. Like, this is the things not to do. And if you are finding yourself in a community where a lot of these flags or alarm bells are going off, just an encouragement, slow your roll, think twice, seek outside opinion, check your gut, check your heart, and know you're not crazy. And in a reality distortion field, hopefully this is a sort of a clearer signal you can perhaps index off. I think that's probably a mixed metaphor, but there we go. So, so the first one, um, I'll just I'll, I'll lay out the three, and then we can unpack them in detail. I, there's three subsets to each. So the first one is, does the leader grab the one ring of power? And this is probably the most central um, and non-negotiable one. So if we use, you know, the, uh, the Lord of the Rings as the example, and, you know, obviously the one ring is the one that the hobbits carry and the golem had, um, it is incredibly potent. It conveys godlike power. And the whole story and the brilliance of Tolkien is the depth and layers to how he lays that wrestling with power and virtue and evil. And... You know, Boromir is one of the men. I mean, Aragorn is the only uncorruptible man, right? Boromir is, is there, but he wanted to be king. He has aspirations. And there's that great scene where they're, they're climbing up the snow-capped peak, and, and Frodo drops the ring. And Boromir picks it up. And as he picks it up, and he's going to give it back to Frodo, but he kind of hesitates. And he sends, starts hearing the, the ring rates, and it sort of all gets freaky-deaky. And, he's, and, he, and you can see, and he's struggling with the, but I could do so much good with this. Right? And his, he is being bent towards grabbing the ring. The same happens with Saruman. Saruman the White, right? originally the baddest ass and more potent than Gandalf. But Saruman is eventually like, this is inevitable. Look how much we can do. Bond together with me. We can change the world. So even as he is being bent by power, he is still aspirationally uh, ascribing to virtue. And I, don't, I think it's Gandalf. I don't know whether this is Gandalf or Dumbledore. But one of those guys has to say uh, that, that no dark wizard uh, did not begin seeking truth. And I think that's a really critical one to note because um, it's, easy, it's easy to dismiss culty cults and the gurus with feet of clay as charlatans. They were pretenders, they were fake. So when in, inevitably it goes off the rails, everyone's like, ah, ha, ha, see, we told you so. The whole thing was a sham. And I think that's a really flattened, not very nuanced interpretation. 
And if you take Arida and Osho, I mean, many people are familiar, probably most familiar these days because of that Netflix documentary, Wild Wild Country with Osho, um, which actually weirdly didn't go into him much at all. I, I, was, I was frustrated uh, by the lack of insight into him uh, and his actual teachings uh, versus the scandals of, of the commune and that kind of thing. Um, but for those that don't know Adi Da, he was arguably one of the most potent realizers of, the, of that era particularly of the kind of 70s, and, and left a lineage of, I mean, many, many uh, bright lights in the, you know, more recent, you know, spirituality space touched him at some point. Um, and you can't dismiss those guys as easily. They were prodigious talents, and they had absolutely non-ordinary skills and the ability to shift state in themselves and others and, and create potency. So it's not, enough to, it's not enough to dismiss them. The question is, is did they at some point grab the one ring. It what does that mean in to grab the one ring? What, well, that? what it means, I think, is basically um, there's a Jungian psychologist, brilliant guy named Robert Johnson, and he has a, a great phrase for this, which is our golden shadows, right? And the idea of, it's not just our shadowy shadows, the dark stuff we disown and can't fess up to. There's our golden shadow as well, which is I can't be that great, but Tony Robbins can. Right? I can't be that great, but Brad Pitt you know, or Kylie Jenner right? have the capabilities, have the virtues, the things I value, but not me. And quite often when we end up with charismatic gurus, they will light people up on stage or wherever they are, and people will puke. I mean, this seems to be a, a reflex of tribal primates. Right? We will puke our golden shadow onto the human who connects the circuit and lights us up. It's like little ducklings getting imprinted by the first face they see, right? And, and if you bring people into high self, true self, the first face they see is often the sage on the stage. Now, the one, grabbing the one ring is the equivalent of accepting that gold, right? Of saying, I am strong enough to hold it. Yes, I deserve it. I am that. And no matter how tempting that is, it's only a matter of time before that gold will drop that person to their knees. And there is a dynamic where, you know, what you could call sort of the Lucifer principle, right? Where, and this goes back to prodigious talents. How is it that so many totally gifted teachers actually end up going, going to the dark side? And it can be that, if, you know, you can be 99% translucent, radiant. And if you've got 1% shadow still left, you're now shining so brightly, right? That the Lucifer principle kicks in, which is, you know, dare thee to look upon me and spot my imperfection. I am radiant, I am dazzling, and you, mere human, bowed, cowed, cannot see my humanity or my fallibility anymore. And as a result, right, now I'm pulling all kinds of juice, I'm engaged in psychosexual, spiritual technologies, whatever I'm doing to juice this high, and now that metastasizes. So I could be 99% done on the way to God consciousness, and that 1% speck can and I can suddenly become a Sith Lord. And there have been researchers on, you know, fMRIs on power these days, and, you know, po power literally corrupting. I mean, Lord Acton 101, right? Absolute power corrupting absolutely. And in the psycho-spiritual tantric spaces that many of these folks are playing with, it, it can do that in overdrive. And so you can have somebody who is absolutely love, light, goodness. And many of the stories start out for the first years and decades even of just, it's sunshine and rainbows, man. This is the next, this is the next evolution of humanity and then bends. And I think that's potentially some of the darkness. So the advocacy is either don't grab the ring, have the fellowship, um, and or uh, as opposed to the Luciferian principle, the grabbing and the claim is to embody the more Christic archetype, which is my humanity is, is connected to my divinity. They are not separable. And, and it is the combination of those two that leads to something really uh, durable and, and worthwhile. Uh, so then the next one is uh, the idea of creating in and out groups. Uh, so anytime there is a separation of who we are versus the rest, uh, that is massively problematic. And, and the third is the weaponizing of peak experiences and healing. So we can kind of go back and kind of un unpack these uh, one by one. Yeah, because you've got some really good, uh, solid um, examples within all of these kind of headings. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, just, just to kind of go back, I mean, the first one is, is there's a lot of meat on that bone, so it's kind of worth it. One of the first things to notice is uh, in the grabbing of the one ring, we talked about the accepting of kind of the golden shadow of the followers versus constantly giving it back, saying, no, you are that too, right? Own it. 
Don't, don't give it to me, don't give it away, right? Hold it and, and live into that, right? The first one, which is a dead giveaway, is a mythologized origin story of the founder. This is either prodigious birth, early childhood, signs of talent, whatever it is that they are somehow have been set apart from way back when for greatness. Uh, it can also, another variation is the profound conversion experience. And this has become a trope in info marketing. You know, I was making tons of money, I was doing such and such, and then a car accident, or then a something, and I woke up in my hospital bed and I realized, you know, now my, my mission in life is to sell shit to other people, right? Um, that is the current perversion of it, but it exists, you know, the ancient, you know, well, ancient, yeah, I suppose ancient, is the, you know, Saul uh, on the road to Damascus. Right, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. I was a heroin junkie, crackhead dealer, and now I'm here to bring you the good news. Whatever that is, right? So there's some highly stylized, mythologized origin story that sets that person apart as if they were marked for destiny and greatness. The next is absolutist claims of attainment. So I am 100% awake, enlightened, fill in the blank, whatever their descriptive categories are. And the key there, and this, this is, you know, that Lucifer principle was another articulation of this. If that's true, then everything that happens in relationship to me is now um, no longer mutual or intersubjective. Uh, because I'm perfect, and this is an absolute attainment, it happened back when, it's usually rolled into my mythologized origin story, um, I am not subject to human to human critique. So if you've got a problem with me, right, that must be your shadow. It must be your projection. It's your shit, not mine. I've got no shit. Or, and this is the final one, because it's like, no, wait a second, what you did, you chucked somebody into a fire. I mean, I had a, 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 a Terry Patton actually describe this. He said, he said, Adi da chucked me into a bonfire in a fit of seeming rage, but it woke me the fuck up and I'm forever grateful. And you're like, dear God, right? You look at that from health and human services, you know, or any other kind of grounded perspective. You're like, that is abuse. But within that frame, and even within his interior experience, shit worked, right? So you have this claim of, I'm not subject to some intersubjective critique. I'm no longer human in the way you're human. Everything that you're experiencing is your shadow and projections. Or this is crazy wisdom. I might be acting batshit. I'll grant you that. But I'm doing it for your liberation. And that leaves people absolutely gone and rudderless from any kind of recalibration and any kind of mutuality. And then the final one, which often comes, especially when people adopt Eastern uh, habits and customs and hierarchies, is ritualized separation. Ritualized separation of the leader, the founder, whatever that person is, from the rest. And, and that can lead to, you know, and that will show up as things like satsang, you know, which is basically translated as sitting, experiencing the grace of the master, which is totally fucked in a Western context, right? But people will use that all the time. Or there's a difference in robes and dress. You know, if you've ever seen somebody who looks like they're at Burning Man on a Wednesday, you know, wearing bindis and white flowing robes and shit like that, you know, all of those kind of things, any kind of name change, you know, self-appointed and obviously my name is now super, super Ananda something or other and I am bliss and holy, you know, holy uh, all coming things. Um, those, those descriptions are all, you know, clumsy efforts of separation and exceptionalism. And it can even happen um, in a sort of secular sense. It can happen with handlers. It can happen with green rooms. It can happen with, you only have contact with me when I'm on stage. And otherwise I disappear and I get whisked off and there's protection around me. Or if you really want personal contact, you've got to sign up for my super duper platinum, you know, 100 grand a year uh, special package, right? So any of those, it can be secular. Uh, it is often, and it's least imaginative versions, you know, apes, uh, more esoteric and lineage traditions, but any of that kind of separation. And so those are, those are really things to look out for, which is if you hear a overly polished mythologized origin story, if you experience them s explicitly stating or even implying or allowing others to name them as fully and explicitly and irreducibly awake or attained or something, big flags. And if you see any of the signs and signifiers, the trapping, the costuming, the structuring of the ritual, ritualized and tightly constrained presentations to community, all big flags, all big flags. So, so the next one is the in-groups. 
and versus outgroups. Now, this one is tricky because um, there are lots of communities that really do feel like they've got a world-saving purpose. That's a big part of, you know, purpose. You know, I mean, Silicon Valley's great joke you know, on the, the HBO show was every single pitch at TechCrunch tech, tech ended with, and we're going to make the world a better place, you know, which might have flown five years ago, not so much now. Um, but in groups and out groups and messianic sense of purpose. Messianic purpose is often used to suppress my individual needs. So particularly, I mean, the simplest example is volunteer labor, right? Oh, you must not care about saving all the whales. You must not care about saving the earth if you're not willing to work for nothing, work, work for, for cheap, et cetera, et cetera. It's crazy long hours, lousy conditions, because if we're always holding up this amazingly, overwhelmingly higher purpose, then your petty needs are just that. And so there's often a suppression of where we are, right? And it can often require, and it often supports neglecting other base level needs. It could be relationships, children, economic stability, you know, a thousand work-life work balance, a thousand things, because this is always so much nobler. And I can't critique that noble purpose, so I have to suppress my own experiences. The next would be uh, specialized language. Uh, the more you end up, and you know, Every community from the army, you know, to business consulting has acronyms, has shorthand. It's a way we compress information to use it quickly. Um, but when you have uh, abstract, non-falsifiable, pseudo-spiritual terms, either using esoteric terms, particularly, again, defaulting to uh, Eastern traditions quite often, um, or pseudo-scientific terms. This is the quantum field. This is our pineal gland, or, I'm, or mixed total jumbles. I'm entering the Akashic field via quantum theory and my pineal gland and my my theta waves. I mean, you see people mixing and matching um, shoddy neuroscience with poorly understood lineage traditions with new age concepts into this jumbled gobbledygook that nobody, family members, colleagues, former family, you know, like partners, understands what the fuck you're talking about. And that creates a further separation between you and the rest of the world. And, you know, and then finally, um, some sense of um, that this is, this is, um, we are on the verge or the edge of something brand new. There is nothing that has come before us that is quite the same as this. We're unique and distinct and also, therefore, not subject to the calibration or the, the dampening or critiques of past precedents. Yes, they all did that, thought that, said these things, did these things. We, however, are the, the blank slate the true tabula rasa. And as a result, we don't have, um, there, is no, there are no governors. <laughs> There's no, there are no governors. We are literally writing our own story forward. And then the final one is just uh, the idea of the weaponizing peak experience and healing. And, and the, the first is quite often these communities grow together via tightly controlled access to those peak experiences. So someone might, you know, they're looky-loo, they get recruited, they get invited, they drop by. They have some amazing state-changing, state-shifting experience. It could be breath work, it could be radical encounter, group dialogue, it could be a tantric, psychosexual experience, it could be a psychedelic experience, you name it. They have something that literally blows their mind. But you only get access to that thing, to that experience, via the leader, when they choose, right? And they get to shape the meaning-making around it. And typically, um, side efforts are strongly discouraged. And if they are, and, and either they, you know, if they are tolerated, they're usually the meaning making. What's going on is very scripted. Like you two go off and shag, or you guys go and have that psychedelic experience, so you can go and access the world we've described, right? But iconoclastic, heretical experiences, like, well, we went and conducted that experiment and got totally different results. And here's what I think now, you know, that, that will get shut down in, in a hurry. Um, and the next step on deconditioning, because obviously peak experiences and profound healing experiences um, erode our boundaries, right? And typically these communities massively overprivilege emotional catharsis, versus cognition and discernment. Now, part of that is natural. There's a healthy counterbalance to our hypercognitive, hyperlinguistic, neurotic, constantly self-aware, default mode network, agitated monkey mind, modern selves. Got it, right? And most of us are super disembodied and not enough in our hearts and all those kind of things. So there is a absolutely legit corrective argument. But when it's, when it's pillar to post, 
when they say don't think or you're thinking again that's bad you've got to get back down in your heart and feel that's good when there's a complete vilification of logic reason discernment right that becomes massively problematic and then that sets us up for the final whammy of them all which is key decisions and commitments whether that is emotional um, testimonies sharing disclosing information vulnerable compromising information whether that's allegiance to the group whether that's atonement for transgressions whether that's financial and commitments i'm signing over my entire trust fund i don't know how i got here i just happen to be a rudderless rich kid my gosh they love me so much and now i've just had this boundary dissolving experience and i capitulate because the truth of the experience i'm having that cathartic ecstatic breakthrough breakdown whatever it might be they now couple to all those other truth claims see this proves that we are special and different this proves that our master or teacher is attained this validates and vindicates everything else we've been saying at a time when your boundaries are completely permeable you have no judgment of your own and we are deliberately moving you and manipulating you. and this by the way does not require overt cults this is chapter and verse info marketing 101 Let's blow the smoke cannons. Let's get everybody up there weepily saying how much this thing has changed their life. And oh, wouldn't you know it, we're going to upsell the shit out of you on our premium program right fucking now. So we see these psychotechnologies deployed across the spectrum. Um, and just a couple of things to point out. One is false positives and false negatives. So the false positives, uh, if you go through this checklist, you're like, well, wait a second. I mean, I kind of think maybe my community does some of those, especially the world saving purpose and specialized language, you know, and even even uh, the idea of kind of in groups and out groups like we are a crack team. We're doing a hard thing. Um, so you might go through this list and see false positives for an otherwise healthy organization or community. And the only way to check is just see how many of the other flags, especially the one ring of power and especially the manipulating people in suggestible states and conflating truth, power, sovereign, you know, authority with the vulnerability and pliability of people in those states. And the other is the false, um, what did I say? I said false positives. The other is the false negatives. You can come around many of these communities, especially in the earlier years, and it's shiny, happy people. It's going off. It's the best fucking party you've ever seen. People are filled with love. They're hugging, they're playing, they're joyful. So in the, by their fruits, ye shall know them. And you look and you're like, man, this is an abundant garden. This looks amazing, right? It's, it's because of their use and abuse of these super powerful psychotechnologies, not in spite of them, that they're getting that early lift off. So the key there is to really understand, again, discernment, caveat emptor. We really have to pay attention. We really have to play the long game. And we really have to triangulate between these different touch points to make informed and empowered decisions about not only who we follow, but if we are in a position of leadership ourselves, what kind of communities do we create? And can we see the known issues? Can we see the potholes and the train wrecks and the skid marks where those who have come before us have gone off? the road and can we steer a straighter path to get more of us to our collective destination recently jamie led a workshop with rebel wisdom in london called ethical cult building collective sense making in an age of existential risk to see the films from the workshop become a rebel wisdom member rebel wisdom is a new sense making platform bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world if you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.